Okay. Um, first of all, I'm going to say that I expect us to be having the exact same conversation in 15 minutes when I'm done as we've been having for the last half an hour. Um, so whether or not I contribute anything um, to this is, is yet to be determined, but I think that we've all been hitting all afternoon on the issues that we have at hand and the difficult choices that are going to have to be made in a collection of interim and longer term solutions to get to our scientific ideals and our policy ideals as well. Um, so I was just tasked with policy and ELSI. Broadly, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that means, is it, other than, than a large bin to go through. So um, I am going to begin by my very simplified um, view of the scientific aims, because I think whenever we're talking about policy or ethics issues, that that's the scientific goals are where we need to start, and um, the design that we put into the science has, has huge implications for what our policy choices then need to be. And I think that that, again, has already come out this afternoon as we've talked about what are the priorities that we're going to have. Um, so again, in simplified terms, we want to build data resources with sufficient power and flexibility to ask really big questions and find really small answers. And what I mean by that are the, the um, smaller con um, genetic contributors or the rare variants where we're not going to see really big effects. Um, we also want to have high-powered statistical analysis capability as well as biologically relevant science so that all different scientists from different sectors can use the data and ask the questions of the data that they would like to. And we want to work across disease disciplines using multiple data types and common structures in terms of platforms or phenotype um, measures so that we can really, again, maximize the amount of data that we're able to use in our analysis. So we've set out a pretty tall charge in terms of what we're trying to get to. And there have to be um, compromises made along the way, I think, to be able to, just for practicality purposes. And, and that can be um, because of policy issues, um, but it can also just be from technical issues that I think we've been working through. And so it's going to be an iterative process to get to where we want to go. So um, I'm also going to, as you'll see as we go through this, I'm going to put out some basic context to think about this in. I'm going to ask a lot more questions than I'm going to answer, and I'm not going to walk through the individual models um, in particular with, with one exception, because um, I knew that Ewan was going to do that, and the papers are there, and a lot of the um, work went into those papers and laid out some of the specific issues. Um, so to talk first about systems of oversight, and just to acknowledge this is a proxy for ethics. Our oversight systems are not ethical concerns, and there are different questions and different ways of thinking about this. But the oversight systems are sort of how we embody the ethical principles that we have developed through research and other societal conversations. And this, again, is, it's, it is a systems and a relational process. So there are um, oversight and policies that are made at the level of the project. As we've heard, some projects and um, programs are releasing different p-values, others are not. Um, and so there are these, these make big differences into what happens with the science, even down at the individual program level. Then there are local oversight issues in terms of the institutions that you belong to, the states that you live in, in the case of the US, where our state systems are all over the place in many cases. Um, and then finally, there can be high-level policies and regulations which come to bear then and can trickle down to some of these other issues, um, but they're going to be at the more principled or 30,000-foot level. There are also then this, an interaction with systems of trust that we have to, to think about and that have an effect on how we answer the questions that we've all been asking this afternoon. And here we have, again, a relational system where we have the oversight and the policy systems we have researchers who are trying to accomplish particular goals, and we have the public who are asking to participate and to contribute their samples and their information to this, and we require their trust in order to do this. And part of that then speaks directly to their willingness to give us this information and to be a part of this. And what are they willing to sacrifice in terms of their privacy or in terms of, of their autonomy, as we'll talk about going forward through this. And all of this, again, is what we're trying to, where we're trying to accomplish the research that we want to move through this space. And so we have to think about all of these things together and, and how do we fit them together? How do we um, make different choices in different ways to accomplish different aims? Um, things to think about, again, always the science. What are the priority aims? What, um, what is it that we most want to accomplish? And we could have a different answer for, for some of those different goals. Um, from a policy perspective, um, what are the questions that we need to think about for any model, whether it's the four models we're talking about today or some various iteration of them? 
Um, they are, I think, and this is not a comprehensive list, but the ones that we talked about largely in the papers or that I was thinking about have to do with participant autonomy and choice and how their data are used, which comes down to questions around informed consent and what we've all you know, talked about, broad consent, narrow consent, um, best practices for consent, consistent consent, all kinds of issues in different ways to try and um, speak to that issue of the conversation between the researcher and the participant and the understanding that both have in how the research will be conducted at the time and into the future. Um, participant privacy interests, what are they, what does privacy mean, and I'll, I'll explore that a little bit further. Um, the potential for recontact in terms of, of going back to participants, and again, this could be for additional analysis, as we've talked about um, earlier, or for just return of results, which has to do, again, with the participant interest in, in coming into the studies at all. Um, we also agreed pretty early on that this is really complex and we, you know, a longer term situation and so something that we want to keep in mind because this is important for science but that we're not necessarily going to solve in the next day and a half. Um, and intellectual property issues, this is a little bit more mundane but it is fundamental to what we're trying to do in terms of how the data are used. Um, how different sectors of the research community use the data um, and how they remain available for others um, to use in the future. Other questions, um, what's possible within existing frameworks and what will require new development? We've been, again, wrestling with that all afternoon. And um, something to that I think is important to think about from the context of the way I look at things every day is, is how can we scale this and how do we track it? Um, anything that we propose, it's easy to come up with a different option to do something, but there are technical limitations and there are policy limitations and all of that has to do with the fact that we are based in this systems model where there are relationships and shared responsibilities and we have to think about how we're going to follow those through in a manner that we think is credible, that's beneficial to the research um, process and that can maintain public trust. Um, so I'm going to now throw in just a few sort of sidelines that are not directly relevant to the things that we're talking about today, but they're intrinsic to what we're doing and, and represent the variables that we have to contend with as we're trying to craft policies around these different issues. Um, and one that has come up and we've been talking about recently already is the identifiability issue. There have um, been papers beginning with the Homer paper, two recent papers from Eric Schott and Nancy Cox's lab, again, showing with the power of statistics what we can do to resolve unique patterns within these data. Um, and that is going to continue to happen and it's something that we have to contend with because of the policy and regulatory implications around identifiability and around what individuals think about this and understand about this in terms of what does it mean to be identified um, by your genomic sequence. And that is also in and of itself a changing question probably with time or it has different answers. We also have in the U.S. at least um, our regulatory system um, with an advance notice for a new proposed rule which would completely shift how we manage and oversee human subjects research and, and the protections provided to human subjects in our country. And there are some particular parameters that are um, on point for this discussion, um, naming and again taking a position on the concept of identifiability, naming genetic samples um, as considering them as identifiable, which is a big change for our legal system, but trying to then balance that acknowledgement was saying, well, the risk is just informational, and then proposing that we can deal with that informational risk through data security. And so again, it's trying to reach um, a way to mediate the risk from the identifiability through particular situations, but there are questions about scalability and um, applicability. The other trade-off in that is that under the proposed new rule, then consent would be required for everything to go forward, which again represents a very different model from how samples and data sets have been put together to date um, and so could have enormous consequences for existing data sets and what we could analyze um, going forward versus having to get new consent or reconsent for everything else. Um, so this is something that's out there. It's in a comment period um, with an unknown immersion date. Um, to come forward, so um, we're, we're just waiting to see, but anything that we decide here will be affected by um, how the, the rule comes forward. We also have a Presidential Bioethics Commission which has decided to take on this, this interesting topic of large-scale human sequence information and what it might mean for privacy and data access. They also had a request for information, and I'm not going to go through this, but just want to point out the amount of text 
um, that they put out and questions that they're asking the country, and they're going to have a report in the fall making statements from this high-level commission about um, the ethics involved in these decisions. And again, you can just see from the number of red lines, they're looking at privacy, balancing risks, um, what do stakeholders think, whether they're participants or researchers, um, health IT and other data um, security measures. It's completely unclear what they will say or how, their, um, how deep their recommendations will go. And then, again, another question, what effect those recommendations will have regardless of what they may say. Um, so we just have to wait and see. But they could change um, the nature of our conversation. And finally, then, of course, we need to keep in mind um, the participants again. And what is it that they're seeing in the midst of all of um, the science that we're talking about and the headlines that are coming out about whole genome sequencing, um, the number of individual genomes that are being put out there, the capacity for genomic medicine, et cetera, and researcher conduct. And right now, I'm really going to just focus on some of this. We have two issues um, from the last few years which are well known around um, the Havasupai tribe and the Henrietta Lacks story that, that really speak to this role of what the participant autonomy is and what choices do they have about how data are used in the future, which again is highly relevant for us as we're thinking about building um, sort of immortal resources where we have data and the data are there and we can use them for any questions into the future, theoretically. We also have, um, within the last two years, our President and Secretary of State having to apologize for some horrid behavior of researchers and um, how they um, treated participants in the respect that they showed or did not show for the participants in a particular study, and again, that made headlines, and newborn screening and the use of newborn blood spots, and again, how research, the research system has chosen to use the newborn blood spots and what particip um, not participants, but what the general public knew or did not know and understood or did not understand about how their, their blood spots of their children were going to be used. And so this is all in the news and this all goes into the context of how we maintain trust and how we're going to need to make policy decisions um, because it's, it's not always logical. There's a lot of, of public relations issues in it and a lot of emotions um, that can come to bear. So again, these are the four models we're going to come back and, and look at for today. The open data access, streamlined control, certification of researchers and a research commons, and then the central analysis. And I'm not going to go through them individually um, in great detail with, with one exception, as I said, but just talk about them across the board. I'd rather focus on these issues for consideration that we want to think about and so um, from the ethics perspective. And so autonomy and consent, I think, are fundamental to what we're trying to do. And so again, questions that we ask, what are the participants willing to let their data be used for? How much of a choice do they have in that? And that's a changing paradigm from what we used to think the choice should be that they have and what we're thinking today the choice, choices should be that they have. Um, and related to that is what are the limits of informed consent, both from the, the standpoint of broad consent and is it feasible to ask for broad consent, what does broad consent mean, what do participants understand about that, and also from the perspective of can we use informed consent as the vehicle to solve all problems. If we put it in the informed consent, is that enough? And we can go on. I think there, there are a lot of questions right now over whether or not we are really pushing that, that one mechanism too hard. Um, and expecting too much from it. And then the realities of the research paradigm, and I, I mean this from the perspective of we don't know what we're going to want to do in 10 years, and, and we're dealing now with the fact that we didn't know five years ago what we were going to want to do, even though we thought, you know, we saw lots of exciting possibilities, but we're now living with some of those consequences in just a short time. And also another reality we have to contend with, again, is the relatively distributed nature of investigators and the way research is done. And they have relationships with their own institutions. They're bound by different state laws, different country laws. And all of this has to come together. Um, if we look at the, uh, the consent issues across the different um, models, there are, again, questions that I've asked. I won't necessarily go through all of these. They're um, asked and, in some cases, raised um, with a lot more discussion in the documents. but. Again, with the open access, I just heard just before coming up here, um, Brad expressing doubt as to whether or not open access is ever okay because we just don't really understand what we're asking participants to assume, again, even if they've consented fully um, to what's going on. 
Um, with streamlined controlled, the, the controlled access model, that's really built around consent completely. Everything, um, at least in the NIH system, is around consent groups, and it's structured to abide by data use limitations, which stem from consent. Um, so it, it is looking for efficiencies and incremental improvements that we can make to just make that process better. But I think consent here is really um, attempted to be the, per the, the ultimate principle that, that everything else flows from. And so there are questions about, again, broad and open consent, what governance is needed to assure um, conformance or compliance with the consent and the data use limitations. From the research commons perspective, um, you know, who would certify these researchers to abide by the data use limitations? That's a big question. There was a comment before that it would be um, sort of the ultimate um, compliance mechanism because you could just remove their ability to access any of the data. But I think that's an open question from a policy perspective of, of can you do that? And, and what kind of enforcement do you have based on who would do the certification? Um, and so that's something to think about. And of course, what, you know, we'd want to see some reciprocity if we're going to go in that route to make it easier to work between databases in the US, databases in Europe, and other places around the globe. Um, from the central perspective, um, Pearl in the document, and I think she'll talk later, will we'll raise some questions about just the technical issues with that. And, and if you still have data use limitations, how are you actually going to, to manipulate the data in a way that can respect those when you're pooling them all together? So privacy, uh, you know, the question we've come back to for many years, and it's not getting any easier, though the possibility to resolve unique patterns is getting easier. Um, is, is what does it mean if you do identify a unique pattern? What exactly are the risks? Um, the open access model just assumes that there is no privacy and it accepts it through the con informed consent process um, and moves on. Um, but there's still questions then again about what can you really articulate about this risk and can you quantify it? Um, we know that there can be certain things and certain harms assumed just from being identified as a participant in a research study. That may be a harm to some people. It may not be a harm to others. And so it is hard to articulate, again, on a um, across the board or global way. Um, all three of the other models, I think, attempt to manage the privacy risk in different ways. Um, but again, it comes down to a question of can you really manage the risk and what is the risk, what is the context of privacy these days with all of the other information that's out there about us. And so I think this is a place where we do need to really start having the longer term discussion about the trade-offs between privacy and advancing research and what that means for an individual versus what it means for society and where are different groups in assuming um, the risk of this um, privacy risk, again, or potential harm, um, are participants willing to move on and acknowledge that um, to go forward? And if some are, are others. Recontact of participants and intellectual property, I, I don't, I think that they are important, but again, I don't think that they are things that we will deal with deeply at this meeting. So we can acknowledge that being able to recontact either for return of results or to be able to do additional studies is an ideal, but there will be um, policy work required. And so what we need to do in the interim is do research, scholarly research, quantitative, qualitative, normative on how to do this. Um, and we have some programs at NHGRI underway on this. And also, we need to collect the experience, as Eric mentioned. This is happening now. Some studies are do this, doing this, and we need to learn from it so that we can integrate it and move forward in an iterative way. Um, intellectual property principles, they vary across research sectors. But I do think that um, there is a cultural baseline coming forward that some of these basic data are not appropriate and some willingness not to try to patent everything that comes out of um, these first line studies. But again, we have questions about enforcement and what could the implications be um, for those that don't accept that and what are we as a research community willing to risk by putting the data out there and um, taking our chances. Governance, um, again, coming back to tr public trust and accountability for researchers, for the research system, for funders, um, for everyone involved in the system, um, intrinsic to a lot of the models that we have is a promise of conduct. We will abide by the data use limitations. Um, we will you know, only use information in certain ways. We will um, put in place certain um, data security standards. But to maintain that, there has to be a reasonable expectation from the public's perspective of transparency and compliance and consequence if something is not followed. 
This, as well as other technical issues, bring to bear questions about scale and practicability, which comes um, to bear and in our thinking and in our decisions about the different choices and decision points that we will have to make over the next few days to reach our scientific um, ideals. And so that's going to be, I guess, where I want to uh, stop with the theoretical. And um, I thought it might be helpful if I talked about the controlled access model, particularly the one that I work most closely with at NIH, and talk about some of the things that we are trying to do to improve the system that speak to some of the issues that were raised um, in the, the white papers on this point. So first of all, one of the things that, that we're talking about is trying to build a standard lexicon for data use limitations so that investigators and data access committees understand what given consent groups mean and decisions can be made more efficiently and more consistently and investigators can understand what they're asking for. Um, so hopefully make better choices when they're selecting data sets um, to request. We're also looking at a way to build a centralized data access committee so that those that request multiple data sets can have one data access committee review process, which should shorten the time to make this go forward. Um, similarly, for aggregate data and for those who aren't the deep data users but want to look at the um, higher level information, we're trying to um, design and think about the, again, trade-offs and, and different balancing acts that we need to do to simplify or create another, a, a more um, straightforward way to, to access all of the aggregate data, aggregate data, perhaps through one simple request um, rather than multiple requests, which is how it needs to be done now. And then also, as has been mentioned here, as, as being an ideal, is trying to um, build in filters within dbGaP so that you can sort the data that you're looking for by a particular variant um, or by some of the other factors, study type, data use limitations, some of the other basic things that would make it faster and more straight and straightforward for investigators to identify the right types of data for the questions that they want to address. And for just at the end, just coming back to all of this is about balance, it's about choices, it's about costs and benefits, um, and costs and benefits from various perspectives. So sometimes um, one variable or one concern will weigh heavier than others, and in another case or another choice, it's going to be the other way around. And so where we want to try to get through all of this and through the discussions in the next day and a half is just to try and come to as much of an even balance as we can that's reasonable, and then along the way, we need to assess the policies, we need to assess how we're doing the work, we need to learn from our experience, and we need to adjust what we're doing so that we don't get into a fixed situation and we can continually have a dynamic system that can keep up to the extent possible with the science as it's moving forward. And that, with that, I will stop and open the discussion back up. Yeah, I have a comment regarding uh, the models don't necessarily assume that people change their minds, which happens uh, maybe not so frequently, but it does happen. Uh, so I would think a, a model that takes um, into account that should be a, a, an active informed consent model. And, and the other aspect that I was thinking is uh, if you can monitor what analysis are being done, then you, you can prevent the, the types, some types of theoretical re-identifications that are likely to be very uh, rare. So, so in that case, the model of accessing the data but not necessarily downloading could be uh, very important. Right, and that was one thing that I, I, I forgot to mention in, in terms of one of the options right now is going to the cloud, and that came up earlier, and again, NIH does have a working group that's looking at how to do that and trying to build some case scenarios, and Vivian Bonazzi and Don Preuss are, are co-chairing that and maybe, I think, have plans to call some of you in this room to help them think through the issues because from a policy perspective, I really like that idea of having people not download all of the individual level data. They can go in, they can ask their questions, and it stays in, a, in an environment that we have more control over, though we need to make sure we really have more control over it. And so I do agree with that. Ewan? Laura, um, when, it's kind of interesting. When In these discussions, do you feel that it's about the risk of identifiability or de-anonymization, or is it the risk of harm? I mean, in other words, to what extent does the policy get driven by the harm of that would occur to the participant when de-anonymized? De and therefore, should or, or is there a concept of the gradation for different styles of um, 
cohorts depending on the data that they have? I think that it depends on the conversation. I, I think that we are starting to see more often, and it came through in the white papers, that perhaps some studies, based on the nature of the data collected, would have a different standard for um, what was okay to be released or, or what, um, what security measures you would put in place or need to have in place for access to different things. I do think that the discussion has too much turned on the question of identifiability or not and made it more of the binary decision. Yeah. And that it, that's why I really think now, in particular, we need to go forward and have the discussion about the societal values and how do we manage that across different participant groups um, so we don't lose certain groups, or are there cases just like different types of data that for certain groups maybe we have different security um, procedures in place or access mechanisms in place? But ju just to crystallize that, I, it's from us moving, thinking about the risk of identifiability or the probability of identifiability to the risk of harm. Right. We're, we're, I mean, that's that's the shift in 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 thinking this through, right? It is, and but the risk the risk of harm it's it's so hard to talk about yeah, because but, we can name things, but the likelihood of them happening is a question, and and the interpretation of that harm is I think will be very individual. There will also be some implications by groups, but it will has, mean different has, things to me and to you. Sorry, final question: Has anybody actually done? Has does anybody know of a de-anonymization moment? Did anybody know the moment? I mean, has it ever happened in the last five or ten years? I, to date, I don't know has of it, any has, case has that has happened. Has anybody published the fact that it's not obviously happened? Yeah, we, we published a paper on it last year, um, but it wasn't with respect to genomic data. It was just with respect to mainly health data. There, there's no known cases of genomic identification for malicious intent. There are demonstrations like the work that, that David has done and others. But there, there are no published accountings of explicit identification for malicious uh, gain. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Remember, <laughs> that's that's proof by absence, right? No, no but it's an assessment of the probability. Yeah, <laughs> it's a data point David. for probability. So, I'm I'm curious. There have been a number of comments that have been uh, somewhat dismissive of the idea that we could do a better job with software and security systems of at least. Uh, uh, avoiding inadvertent misuse of data. So I, I take and, and will accept Lincoln's point that a there's no incredibly there's no perfectly secure system that the NSA wanted to hack into any system or you know other cyber crimes uh, could happen. But at least my view of how these things currently work is that we fill out these papers and there's this very careful review. But once the data is actually put on someone's computer, they're actually on their honor to do the right thing in what often is an incredibly complex set of approvals. And in my mind, and this is not about a central analysis server or whatever, especially given that those changes to the common rule, which actually make me quite nervous about, about what's gonna happen. Um, if we had better information systems just to sort of at least avoid inadvertent misuse of data, where it wasn't just you guys read something, send us a letter, and then we're on our honor Right. never to do it again. That would seem like a good thing, but I've heard a number of comments this meeting like, I can't see how we would do that. And I just note my iPhone and Google and the world we live in, like information technology is remarkable. And also like you can put your ATM into any ATM machine in the world and it can query another bank securely and find out how much money's in your account and do the transaction. But we seem nervous about the idea that we could simply annotate a, a, a file with only diabetes non-commercial and somehow a computer system could at least attempt to honor that unless it was intentionally hacked. Why are we so skeptical that things that are already done routinely in all other, the whole other cyber economy somehow can't be done for this very important medical application? So I don't know if I'm so much skeptical as ignorant. I, well, it's, yeah, but, but ignorant, well, not just so, you, so, but others. Yeah, Ignorance but others, is no. being stated as da can't be da done. David, so, so sorry, this is Don. So one of, one of the big differences between those is that those tend to be closed systems. So if we were to come up with a, a com, com, contained set of software that we all agreed on, and that would be the only thing accessing, accessing the data, I agree that it could be possible to do many of these things, or even to place some sort of extra layer in between right. that, re that everyone was required. But then let's be honest as a group and say, we might be philosophically so ill-opposed to the idea of anyone having a system like that Correct. that we're saying it's impossible. It's what we should say is we think philosophically, we have personal belief systems that tell us what can be done. And we might say, for some settings, our personal belief systems will allow us to do other, you know what I'm saying? So Correct. under some settings, we could do such things. We might not choose to, but let's not say they can't be done. 
I totally yes, agree. But so money but is another issue. A lot, a lot more investment went into yeah. those systems. When people hear it can't be done, they say it's not worth discussing because it can't be done. So I'd like to bring the conversation to a slightly different um, level. And that, in terms of what you were talking about, is that the harms are always um, um, uh, contextual and uh, in the context of what the, the, what, what the benefits would be, okay, at least by my view of looking at these things. And that there was, um, uh, right now, okay, in our society, okay, we're in a really difficult position with respect to health care overall because that we aren't improving people's health outcomes, but we're using more and more of society's resources to do it. That's a serious problem, right? So instead of talking about how we're going to protect people's privacy, that I think I wanted to bring the discussion to the point that if we don't figure out a way to take the basic science of people in this room and combine it with medical practice, we're all screwed because, right, it's not right. going to work. So then okay, we have to, and the public realizes this too, so you have extremes on all sides, but we have to have a way of having that be the value proposition and then talking about okay, the, the, the harms or the risks of these different things in the context of that value proposition. So I just would like this group to please make sure that, 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 that we don't forget why we're here. So. And, and I completely agree with that and do think that that is a, a choice that we need to make um, through some high-level national dialogue to, to have some of those questions and that will need to be informed again by looking at the choices and the way different groups, different individuals weigh those trade-offs to be made because I, I think that's information we'll need to have in coming to any kind of even interim conclusion about how to make that value and, decision. And that's where we really need leadership because that the people in this room can only contribute to that if we have the leaders setting a framework for us in that regard. And I think those leaders are the National Institutes of Health, the Sanger Center, the, the funding bodies that take the responsibility to give us a framework. Brad and then Debbie. So, so um, I'll ask a question first and, and then I'll make a quick comment. Um, the, the question that I have has a lot to do with the discussions that I'm hearing today, and it's not exactly clear to me what exactly this resource is being set up for. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it is not in design, in its design, to figure out how to give better medical care or health care, per se, directly. It is, it, there is a design to support research, but we are not tied into electronic medical records in this system. Now, that's a whole different research program. That's a whole different research issue. Now, maybe I'm, I'm being heretical on this, but, but I'll, I'll stake that right now. Um, okay, but that's fine. Um, so, so on the, the flip side, what I, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of, you know, why can't we just put the data on the cloud or something like that? I mean, data is data is data. I, I think that there's a, a more pressing challenge with respect to the policies that you set around that data. Um, but I will say that we, we've done a lot of work in fraud detection and intrusion detection in, in, in extremely complex systems. And, and um, I don't know if you've ever been subject to having your credit card shut off. You know, um, this is one of the concerns that, that people have when, when you're working in these types of complex systems, that you, you detect things and then you start investigations, and a lot of these investigations may lead nowhere. And the things that you really do want to detect, you just have no idea what you're trying to detect. And so it's nice to audit, it's nice to have all the audit logs on hand, but unless you have the models of the workflows of how the information is going to be used, it's very difficult to audit them. And so we'd have to think very hard about what these workflows are. So just laying that on the table. Okay, so Debbie's been waiting. So I just wanted to, I, I agree with David, I think that making the data accessible, like we can globally access everything else, is actually a much better model <laughs> Uh, and I'm not saying f it doesn't have access issues to it, but I will say that every researcher, every student, every could carry much of the data that we have on their computers in, in some form, and uh, they're not supposed to, but that doesn't mean they don't. And I think it's unrealistic uh, if people in this room say it doesn't happen, because it does. And you know, we can find it, we can eliminate it, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but that's a potential broach. I think centralizing 
letting people slice and dice things the way they want, if there is such a thing that could be made available, people will go there and do it. You know, uh, I mean, that was the thing with the variation server. It's just a way for people to slice and dice a data set which anyone can download because right. the information that's in there and if you think is it's in hard, DB Yap. And if you think uh, it's hard. Snip. It's not even in right. DB Yap. It's in DB Snip and freely accessible. Right. But if you think it's hard to audit this centralized system where there might be some work controls, how hard is it to audit every graduate student postdoc walking around with data on their laptop and possibly leaving it somewhere? Like that's a lot harder to audit. And that's where we are today actually, whether or not people want to acknowledge it, that's what can happen. Today. That's no why reason. I'm bringing it up because I think it's a disaster waiting to happen. Well, I, I wanted just to chime in with the, I mean, I, it seems to me that, you know, we don't want to make, to be in the situation where we recognize that there are some samples that need a lot more control, but we do have a lot of samples that are more open, and it would seem to me that what we want is a technical solution that enforces the right data access so that the samples that we are broadly consented, that it's easy to access them consistent with their consent, and the samples that are least consented and the most restricted are protected, and it seems like that's a technical issue that can be partially addressed by some computer system. I mean, there's, there exists computer systems that can enforce that. And that, that would be consistent with our goals for broad access. We want the samples that are ac accessible to be available to us easily, and those that are most dangerous to share should, be, should have the highest barriers. And, and at the same level, there's sort of orthogonal to that is there's different levels of the data. I mean, there's individually identifying reads all the way up to you have a common variant, which probably can't tell you anything about the individual at the single site level. And, and we need to find another technical solution that, that handles that scale as well, that I can access different types of data at different scales depending on the sample, depending on the type of data. I mean, it sh it shouldn't the discussion be around what, how do we implement such a system and what, how do we articulate those requirements such that the things we've promised to patients and samples are, are enforced. But I, I, again, I, I don't think uh, in, the, I, I, in this debate, I don't think it's, it's, it's useful to set these up as either ors. There's a whole variety of things we can do to improve access and, uh, and um, systems. And I think we get ourselves into trouble when we set these things up in, in, a, in a kind of we either do this or we do this or we do this. Um, and I'm, I'm quite attracted by the idea of this shift to risk of harm rather than risk of, of uh, identifiability because I think it helps place a lot of these things. Uh, to take David's analogy, the, the other thing, the key thing in the ATM scenario is that system has accepted a level of risk of fraud. Right. And, yeah, I, and, I, and basically the system's comfortable with it. Yeah, I, I, want to say that, I want to say that my earlier remarks have been misinterpreted to, to represent an absolutist position that I don't hold. All I was saying was that the, the central server cannot replace the, the certification and or DAX or whatever societal uh, regulation po policy we have because there's always a way of hacking into it. There, it's exactly the same with credit card fraud. We have lots and lots of technical ways of making it hard for people to commit tech, uh, credit card fraud. However the, ult however, the ultimate way of, of controlling it is to have laws that put people in jail for, do it, for, for, for uh, executing credit card fraud. Same, same thing with ATM machines. You can take a sledgehammer and break into the ATM machine if you want to. There are laws that prevent you from doing that. And that so we need to have both, and that's all I was saying. Eric? Following up on that, did your committee in preparing for this discuss local IRB approval? Because they seem to be, that is the one place where investigators, local investigators tend to listen to in terms of their standards of behavior. Um, so I don't think we talked about them explicitly in that way. I mean, I think that local IRB education and some Providing some more explicit guidance, I know, would be greatly appreciated um, for the local IRBs, and Pearl may be able to respond more to that so that there is some consistency in what they think they're supposed to do. I think right now, because we're operating in a space that's outside of the regulations, um, 
there's a lot left up to individual interpretation um, for that because it's, it isn't clear. And that's one thing that the ANPRM would do. It would, it would set a very clear standard and everything would flow from that. So it would make some of the choices easier. It may just have trade-offs and costs to what could be done with the research that we might not like. So um, I do think the local IRBs is, is a linchpin in how this is done because of the shared responsibility. Um, and it's one that's, and that's hard to get at because it is distributed and because um, the IRB and um, common rule as it's set up is intended to be locally heavy, I guess, in its emphasis so that issues of individual populations um, can trump other larger concerns. And that's something when we're looking to build large repositories that we have to contend with. Debbie? I think it, it comes back to, I, I think everybody in this room would support something more global, uh, whatever that model will become. But I think in the end, there has to be what uh, Lincoln brought up, what is the punishment for doing wrong in a system like this? And you know, I often ask the uh, uh, people who are in the data access, well, what if somebody doesn't, you know, do right by this? And they say, well, there's not much we can do. I mean, I think if we're going to do something like this, we have to have serious measures and say what it is will happen to somebody if they do something wrong in the system. I don't think you can just, I mean, uh, sure, am I going to let everybody have my financial information and not know that if they stole it that they, they'd get arrested? That's, that's nice to know, okay? And, and I think the same, we have to think about people's uh, uh, data in the same way. There has to be rules set up as what happens to people if they do something right. off. I mean, we have it in scientific fraud. I mean, people are not allowed to, to get access to NIH funding. I don't know if it's for the lifetime. I don't even think it's that strong, but uh, uh, I don't know. So that is a question that we've We've asked the Bioethics Commission to ask themselves um, because they are at a position to be able to make that kind of recommendation um, about this. And, and I think, again, as a community, I, there are some papers that I've seen out there that propose um, a criminal penalty system for this kind of information as solving the problem because there's then a set of expectations. And if you don't follow it, then you know it's beyond fines and, and other things. So I think that's definitely something that should be in the consideration in the back. Uh, just following up on the issue of, of governance and um, accountability and so on, and I think, of course, it's important uh, that there's compliance, but I'm also curious whether there's any thinking going on about governance with respect to factors external to the research community. So not, not so much just ensuring that researchers use the, the data and access it appropriately, but what about protecting, for example, against federal government saying, you know, you, sh you will now make this data available to law enforcement agencies or, or things like that, because those things, I think, also fall under governance, and, and how might they be um, incorporated? Right, so I think, you know, right now, we have put in place with our existing controlled access model that that, that federal government wouldn't be in a position to go back and, and compel someone um, to release the individually identifiable information that they have. That's part of why we don't hold any information, so that we don't have it um, to provide. And then we just encourage, I mean, again, we're working in our current system with our existing tools, and so we encourage the, the certificates of confidentiality. Those aren't perfect. There's a lot of, of distrust of, of how far they would go. We've looked at ways to strengthen that kind of grant. Um, we haven't made any progress yet, but it's certainly something that I think people are worried about, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's as likely of a harm um, as people may think that it could be. I think that's one of those cases where fear perhaps has taken over, fear of a possibility has taken over in terms of the size of the likelihood. It's just, just to follow up, uh, I mean, law enforcement, I think, is just an example, but I think right. there, there are, I mean, many other things, right? Uh, I mean, if if uh, you know laws laws change all the time, right? And if uh, you know uh, another, I mean, another secondary use might be for uh, pharmaceutical companies using it for marketing purposes, things like that. Right, and again, that's why we were very again in the existing model. It's very careful to say it's for research purposes, and why we're so tied to consent 
and data use limitations because um, those requests that would come in and why there's an individual request process, they wouldn't be acceptable under our systems um, that we currently have. I think it also speaks to what Debbie was talking about, about wouldn't it be nice if there were a broad, broader legislative system that talked about what appropriate uses were for genomic data um, and had some penalties attached to that. We're not in a place right now where we have that, but that would certainly is, is something that I've thought about a lot, and again, goes back to the model of the financial systems. You know, there are, there are certain people that can have access to data to do certain things, and maybe that is where we are to instill the public trust and confidence in the system with this kind of information, and not just genomics, but health information more globally probably, too. I was wondering if you wanted to comment on to what extent if the phenotype information is obtained from electronic medical records, from health records, that HIPAA would actually cover the uh, inappropriate release of the information. Um, so with regard to the phenotype information, again, I think it would depend on what phenotype information it was and what else it was linked to. Um, because it could be that individual phenotype data points, just like genomic data in and of itself, doesn't fall under HIPAA unless it's attached to some other identified <laughs> private health information. And so things could be released, and I do worry much more about phenotype information being um, released generally and, and what people can learn from that and how that could be pinpointed back down to an individual than the genomic information. So, yes, Jeff. Yeah, I wanted to emphasize the distinction between the public perception of risk and uh, actual risk. And I don't think there's any question that the public is moderately concerned about genetic uh, uh, risks of a variety of different sorts. I think stigma and discrimination are far and away the, the biggest concerns. But also, as we conduct our focus groups, we've heard probably a dozen times that folks are concerned about things like cloning. So I think the public has a limited understanding of these issues, and I think in many circumstances they're just plain wrong. And in fact, I think the empirical fact is that this type of research has been extraordinarily safe uh, and low risk. And I don't think anybody wants to say the risk is zero now or forever. And certainly the sorts of uh, efforts that folks are making with this very discussion and sort of safeguards being discussed are, uh, are all justified to think about. But I think it's also uh, entirely justified to say that the track record for this type of research has been extraordinary. <laughs> And so I think that the genetics community has been in a defensive crouch for quite a few years uh, about these risks. And I think it may be time to, to do a couple things. One would be to make sure we collect all the data on the adverse events so we can give accurate depictions of, in fact, what the risks are. But at some point, I think it's quite justified, and I would say probably now, to really push back with the public and with potential research participants to say the track record for this type of research is uh, extraordinarily good. The risks aren't zero, uh, but uh, experience and justified by quite a few years of uh, this type of research now, the risk is really very low with the kind of prudent safeguards that are in place. So I guess I would welcome both that data collection piece and some additional efforts to begin to push back so that the public really recognizes that this is potentially valuable stuff with extraordinary limited uh, risk. So and if, I, I, if I could um, just respond to that, Laura. Yes. Um, the, 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 um, I, I think there's an a overemphasis on risk. I, I actually agree with the comment, and it's actually very reassuring, and I think would be a very positive part of public engagement to, reassure, to provide reassuring data about uh, how low the risk of re-identification is. Uh, when we talk to participants, and if you look at empiric data on participant views, it seems pretty clear um, that there is a whole other um, aspect of the conversation that I think is equally important, and it starts really with engaging in the, uh, with the public. So I think the public has an interest in how their data are used. They're interested in receiving reassurances that data are used to generate societal benefit. Um, they view those resources as important resources that should be used to achieve um, purposes that they value. And so I think, it's, I think it's, it's great and important for us to reassure people about the risk of re-identification, but I think it may be far more important to talk about why the kind of data sharing we're talking about today has the potential to 
um, enhance benefits of research. I think this is uh, really the point that David was making. I, I think we really need to shift the conversation toward here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it and here's uh, where we see uh, a pathway to benefit that matters to all of us. And I would think that that strain of the conversation and the, the data strain of that and some of this go into this conversation about the value prospect that we could have, which also gets to Ewan's you know, desire to move more to risks of harm. And you can put all of it together. Can I follow up quickly on that? I very much agree with Wiley, but I, also, I would make a distinction here again, too, between harm which I just said I think is extraordinarily low, and wronging people. And I don't think we've done a very good job with the latter. I think it's been quite common for folks to be asked for their samples or data for one purpose, and we turn around and use it for something entirely different. That happens all the time, and it's a huge problem. And I think the public may well lack trust in us by virtue of uh, not being transparent in that regard. So I think that's a huge eth ethical issue doesn't translate into harm, but I think it does translate into to wrongs. It's really a reframing of the conversation around respect rather than risk alone. And then Carlos, and then Pearl, and then I'm sorry, but I have to go pick up my children. <laughs> I think the other thing to think about is how this is going to evolve over the next five years or 10 years, or as this generation that's used to putting information on Facebook and trying to organize and so on is, is evolving, right? So folks now, you know, the notion that you'd put everything out on Facebook, you know, people don't want everybody looking at it or trust Facebook with all their information or trust Google with all their information. So, you know, why would they trust NIH-backed right. researchers, right? And so people are already sort of very, you know, I think that that pendulum is swinging in terms of how comfortable people feel sharing all kinds of information. And I think EMRs and associated genetic data are just going to be part of that whole big discussion. And so I think it's really critical to engage it in thinking about that long term. I completely agree. And there are, there are patients like me and other organizations in the direct-to-consumer movement which are showing how much people are willing to put this into play for the aims of improved health. Pearl. Um, I just really wanted to agree with uh, both Jeff and Wiley, but I think we need a good PR campaign in that while we're fighting to say trust us, you know, we really can't show that people have been hurt in any way. Um, the HIPAA privacy and the disclosure issues, state laws on disclosure, I mean, it's a dime a dozen of lost laptops, and it's now on the front page of most of our papers. So I think if there were some way, I agree, of getting the message out, we got to get people and the press thinking, I think, a little bit differently because, um, you know, again, the high tech is just killing us. Okay, I'm not sure if there's a more discussion or is it dinner now? Dinner. 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 All right, thank you. <laughs>